Hello. Hello. And welcome to Finish Big. Big. Yeah, we are listening our way through everything that Big Finish has thrown at our ears. And yes. will do in the future, I'm sure. Every bizarre niche bit of toot that Big Finish has put out. <laughs> Earth search. Oh, please. I've got to say that at the beginning every of every single episode time. now. Yeah. Although I'll say this is sort of one of the nichiest things. It is, yes. So this time we are going back to summer 2003. And we're looking at the first three Unbound stories. That's right. What if? What if, yeah. What if... Finish Big was created by a fine gentleman known as Dylan Rees, and he recorded an episode on the Unbound series featuring Doc Ho and Mark Raw XXX. I mean, I've got no idea, but I imagine it would be the best episode yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful to be here, taking my Finish Big virginity. We've all podcasted together many times before, but never we've never finished big together. No. Yeah. It was always inevitable, though, wasn't it? <laughs> I thought it was going to happen in Oldbourne, to be honest. We're talking about Unbound Doctors. So, Dylan, are you a fan of an Unbound Doctor? Oh, I love an Unbound Doctor. Uh, I've always loved this range. I, I loved them when they came out. Uh, I've loved them revisiting them. It's been a while since I revisited them, so it's good to jump back in. And I'm a big fan of the Warner Doctor in general. Like, I followed him all through the, the Bernice range and everything. So, yeah, Unbound me up. What is it about him then that entices you so much? I think he's just, he is, out of all of the Unbound ones, he is the one that should have played the Doctor. I know they all shoulda, woulda, coulda, but for me, he is the one that absolutely has that big Doc energy. But it's an interesting idea, and I think it's one of the more creative things that Big Finish have done around that time in 2003, when we hadn't had news of the new series yet. No. And this, I'm not sure, was was this for the 40th as part of the 40th yeah. celebration? It, it, it was this and Zagreus is what they basically did for the 40th. And I think, but I think this is a much more interesting thing to do as a celebration of Doctor Who than Zagreus was. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Can I ask you, Dylan, do you think that uh, the Unbound series is a better celebration than the latest specials that we've had? No comment. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. You've always got to get a Once in Future in there somewhere. Oh, sorry. Did you think I was talking about Once in Future? Oh. No, I was talking about the TV ones. Oh, well, then my mind was an audio. <laughs> he hadn't been watching Once in <laughs> no, Future. Yeah, no, He's got like... a life. I, 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 Once in Future, I did 10 minutes of the first one and 10 minutes of the last one, and I just couldn't get through it at all. No, you had the full experience. <laughs> I think you got the best of it there. Yeah. Well, shall I say the, the three that we're talking about today? Oh, yeah, let's do it. Okay, so they are... Old mortality. Do we visit the universe? No, we just catalogue it. Sympathy for the devil. Ah, bollocks, he doesn't speak English. <laughs> and full fathom five. Oh, God, where's the quote? Hang on. <laughs> this is the best one. <laughs> oh. oh, my God, it's a baby! Ah! <laughs> There we are. That sums up beautifully these three <laughs> releases. I don't think it does at all. <laughs> it does. It does. Well, should we just go straight and talk about the first one then? Mm. So, Old Mortality. This was released in May 2003. And this stars Jeffrey Bailden as the Doctor. Also featuring Carol Ann Ford as Susan. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to actually read out the rest of the cast because I think it's such a great cast. So we've got. Oh, we don't want to be here till senility. We've got Matthew Brenner, <laughs> Ian Brooker, Toby Longworth, Darren Nesbitt, and Nicholas Briggs in there as well. This was written by Mark Platt and directed by Nicholas Briggs. Mm, I think we should immediately hand this over to our guest, you know. Okay, great. Yeah, I've heard it. It's good. Now, um, this is actually one that I struggle with a bit. I think there's there's good ideas at the heart of it, but I don't really like Bailden as the Doctor. I think he's too old. The story's fine, but there's, it just lacks atmosphere. And I'm going to say something I never thought I'd say. I quite like Carol Ann Ford in this. I think it might be her best performance. So did I. <laughs> Me too. Oh, what's going on? <laughs> this was the first time. I mean, what she done before? She'd done... Running away from that Dalek in more than 30 years in the TARDIS. But apart from that, this is the first time she's come back as Susan. 
and she's playing it. She's a bit older in this as well. She yeah. she's not having to go back and be the sixties Susan. So this, like, yeah, I think her being great. Play, playing Susan old because yeah. they did this again, didn't they? A couple of times, Susan's War um, in the Lucy Miller series, they had her actually playing an older woman, and yeah. Kel Surprise, Caroline Ford can do that because she's an old woman. Yeah. When they yeah. make her play Susan as a kid in Companion Chronicles and things like that. It, yeah. it, it's a bit like when Sophie Aldred does it, it just don't come off. It's Debbie wobbling in downtime again, isn't it, at the beginning of that? So it's written by Mark Platt, and I thought that was going to put me off because Mark Platt is usually a bit more of a complicated conceptual writer than what I like. I wouldn't say this isn't complicated and conceptual. Yeah, but I, I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite long. It was like yeah. an hour and ten minutes... I think it maybe it was a bit too long for the story. Yeah, I would agree. I think that was... It's the only one I felt that was dragging. And as I said, it's not that there aren't good ideas in there and it's not that it's not like a, a really sort of strong premise. There was just something where... I, it's it's kind of that once upon a time thing where I just feel like I'm listening to a bunch of pensioners like sort of slowly work their way through a script. But that's not to say like... I thought the ending was great. I like the idea of the Doctor sort of being wrapped up in staying in Gallifrey and becoming a writer and all this stuff. Like, So, as I said, the heart of it is good, but I, I'm, I find Platt very hit and miss. I either love what he does or I'm not, like, I'm just not on board. So, but what was it about Geoffrey Bowden that was not sort of hitting it? Because I thought he was great as a... Yeah, as I, an alternative I did first too. Doctor. I'll go into it in a minute, but I, wanna, I want him to explain himself. I just thought, I think he sounds far too old. I know he's supposed to be old, but it, it's just like listening to. I would have actually preferred David Warner in this one, if I'm perfectly honest with you. I just there's there's something about Jeffrey Bailden who, I should say this really, I've never got. Like I've seen a bit of Cat Weasel. He's obviously in uh, Creature from the Pit, and I just think he's one of those old men actors who's always been old, even when he was young. And this, I just don't find. I don't feel like I'm listening to the Doctor in this. I feel like I'm listening to just any old actor. Well, he's not got that grit of William Hartnell the, or even like David the, Bradley. The boy. He hasn't got he, he hasn't, hasn't got, got that, that viciousness that Hartnell could that. sometimes have, does yeah, he? Yeah, I suppose it's that. But I thought it was quite a nice that sort of more gentle first Doctor. Well, do you know, in sharp contrast, I wrote down on my first line in the notes: "Instantly likable, a romantic Doctor dreaming of adventure." I really did like him in this, but I do think there aren't the layers of Hartnell in this. It is sort of, it's one note. He plays the note well, but there's not a lot of shades to this. I like the idea of the adventurer who never had the adventures, but you know when we meet the Hartnell Doctor, he's really sort of hardened and there's a sort of like anger to him that he softens over time. I, d I feel like it isn't the universe that's given him that anger. I feel like it's Gallifrey. That's what I've always thought. And then he learns to be better having left. And here I'm like, what's happened to him over this time to soften him and make him likeable? Like, it didn't seem like the right through line for me for the first Doctor. Well, we're essentially watching The Doctor is Bored on Gallifrey. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the, a great the premise official for a story. what if is what if the Doctor had never left Gallifrey? Oh. Indeed. In fact, I do have some trivia on this, oh, go if on you'll then. bear get with your, me. Get your from my out. Bible, The Inside Story by Benjamin Cook. Where did the actual story come from? John and Nick had sent me a conundrum. Not so much, what if the Doctor and Susan had never left Gallifrey, says Mark Platt. Why did the Doctor and Susan never leave Gallifrey? Something must have stopped them, bound to be something sinister. I also figured that the Doctor, wherever he was, would always be a victim of his own wonderlust and curiosity. If he couldn't leave, he'd jolly well have adventures at home. Jolly well? How old is he? Old mortality is a mirror for a writer who creates worlds in his head. Those worlds are easy to lose yourself in your own fantasies become considerably more appealing than the reality where you have no more control over events. It's more than a little autobiographical. That's what Mark Platt says. So he's basically the Doctor in this. Very boring. <laughs> I like how it's quite authentic in that they do this uh, Hannibal stuff, which is essentially an alternative Marco Polo style series. It's really in keeping with that, with the vibe of the first series. 
and the historicals. I found all that historical stuff a little bit boring. Though. Well, I was more on, interested in the other, it's about the other stuff. Long. It's a bit overly long, all of that. I would have cut that out and I made this fifty minutes. But then the imagery as well, with like the talking elephant and everything, I can I could see it all. Well, Mister Spinoff Podcast, aren't there a couple of characters from Longborough in this? Yeah, that was going to be one of my quiz questions, but you've got that. Well, I don't, oh, I don't actually I know don't which know. characters they are, so we, I may not get the question. I... It's Badger, who's on the front cover of Lungbarrow. Oh my god, is he? Yeah. Ah. I didn't know. Oh, because I was going to say, I bet he had idea. I could see in my mind this sort of Lungbarrow style world that the Doctor's in, in terms of like in the in his room and everything. It was all sort of dark and dingy and cloistery and. It's long like out that. of print at this point. You ain't going to get uh, any more sales by adding this stuff in. I had no idea it had actual oh. lung barrow stuff in it. All it's going to do yeah. is hike up the prices on eBay mm. for the ones who've got it on <laughs> sale. Do, do you know, when I was looking that up earlier, because I was like, I'm sure that's the one, uh, I looked and there was a copy of Lung Barrow for 500 quid. <sighs> I should have put that in my auction, jeez. <laughs> so is Badger the one rowing that boat thing then? Yeah. I think they're described as looking different, but essentially it's the same character, just done differently on audio. Oh, because in my head, it was a literal robot badger with a badger's face. Where he looks more like a ram in in Lung Barrow, doesn't he? But yeah, it's the same thing. What do you guys think of the horror of Susan becoming the president of Gallifrey? Dear God. I mean, talk about being plunged into a time war. That's going to go absolutely nowhere. All she's going to do is trip over a tuft of grass and that, and and that's about it, and start a war with the Daleks. What's going to be her first line of defence? Dispatch the Sensorite ships now! <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just looking at my notes. I've written Susan and Balls, which I, I'm not exactly sure what I was thinking then. Well, you should, maybe, she, maybe she's, she's got, got balls, balls yeah. yeah. Well, she's standing up to the political system. She's trying to drag her uncle. She goes wandering across the tundra, doesn't she, in the yeah. sort of hologram. But no, immediately, when she goes through the hologram, she immediately falls over, doesn't she? And goes, ah, <laughs> grandfather! <laughs> she does plenty She's of grandfather. still got it. Has she ever done an audio or appearance where she hasn't had to shout grandfather? No. Probably not, no. Oh, that's a good one. Someone needs to tally up all the time she said grandfather. Please don't make that suggestion. Maybe Someone I'll do that. I'll do go it. back and do this, and as we do them, I'll do a tally of grandfathers. You could do the okay. Susan Wailing supercut, couldn't you? <laughs> <Yeah. On YouTube. laughs> Oh, it's a good drinking game, isn't it? You know, you've got to take a drink every time that Susan shouts grandfather or Wales. Rain of terror, you'd be under the table by the end of episode <laughs> one, wouldn't you? <laughs> Can I say one thing I absolutely loved about this? Because I really did like this. I, th- I thought the dialogue was quite poetic. I thought the sound design was excellent on it. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm a bit of a dreamer, so I like the idea of the Doctor as a dream. So I bought into all of that. What I thought was amazing was the ending, which really is the one moment in these three that we're talking about today where the idea of this is explored in an audio as the universe splits two ways and you have the Doctor and Susan leaving Gallifrey and the Doctor and Stephen not Stephen? The Doctor and Susan (laughs) staying on Gallifrey and I just thought that was beautifully done. It had a sort of melancholic edge to it with the ones where they stayed and a sort of wanderlust atmosphere to them going off in the universe. I thought that was a great ending. I think that Susan and that Doctor that go off into the universe, though, get killed at the, on the first planet that they land on. I don't think they've got the skills to take on the universe. Have you not seen the sequel, Storm of Angels? Oh, I have, yeah, yeah, but, I mean, it didn't go well, did it? <laughs> Susan mentions... Does she mention she's got kids? Have I just made that up? She's got a son and a daughter? Oh. Did we Did we hear oh, that? Yeah. I think I did, because I was thinking, I bet that's John and Gillian. <laughs> oh, I'm sure she's got a son and a daughter. These are my great grandchildren. <laughs> Did she birth them or were they loomed? Oh, oh let's not get into get that. Looms. Oh, luckily, we didn't have that audio what experience. That? I know this is going off piece a bit. What was that all about the looms? Well, it's a, it's a classic virgins, uh, well, virgins, virgin new adventures thing of Doctor Who fans not wanting the Doctor to have sex. So they're sort of it's... weaved. Sort of, yeah, because a witch cursed Gallifrey to, to made them barren, so they found a, a way to procreate, and they they basically grown in a lab, but it was like a sexy Time Lord lab, but what not sexy because Time Lords can't have sex. 
You know when you... Oh, this is a very unflattering metaphor, so I do apologise. You know, like, when you have anal sex, right, and your penis goes inside somebody's bum and it goes up the wrong <laughs> the wrong way and you end up in a load of shit? That's basically the new Avengers, isn't it? The penis has gone up the wrong direction and ended up in a load of... I mean, what the hell? This is quite comfortably the, the strangest <laughs> metaphor for uh, the new adventures ever. Uh, I, I apologise. Back onto Susan. Yeah, uh, Jesus. I don't know how we got from there to there. Do you think Susan ever did anal? <laughs> That's a I think she unbound. wailed a lot when she did. <laughs> oh, grandfather! No, please. He's not doing it. Oh, my God. I mean, I've not heard a storm of angels. I don't know if anything... It's a storm of anal. <laughs> Can I say, this podcast is usually <laughs> PG-13 and you come on and look where we've ended up. Well, how about Jeffrey Bowden, right? <laughs> He's done anal. <laughs> he definitely has. <laughs> He's going out with a fella from Coral Fang Rock, isn't he? He was in a relationship with a guy who played Skin Sale. Oh, yes. No, yeah, you're right, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, he was considered <laughs> for the part of the first Doctor. Yeah. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of why they've got him in, in this. Um, well done for bringing us back on track. <laughs> there we go. That, that's all I had to say. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, does anyone else have any pertinent points about all mortality? I, I, just in terms of him being considered as the Doctor, he was considered as the first Doctor, but I think he was considered a few times for the third and the fourth as well, if I remember correctly. I don't want to sound like I really hated the story. It, like, I would listen to it again. I just found... I found the performances a little uninteresting, but the sound design, great. I'm a bit of a sucker for a bit of Gallifrey, to be honest. I mean, I know you know that, Joe, having done Hellbent. But um, as long as it's interesting, Gallifrey, that adds to the mythos. And this this gave me a little bit more Gallifrey and sort of exciting Gallifrey at that. So I, w- I was there for that. Trouble is, it sort of has to be a little bit dull, doesn't it? Because we have to feel sorry that he's stuck there. Yeah. So yeah. the, sort of the romance of this is all this uh, this story that he's making up, the Hannibal story. I mean, yeah. in, an, in an alternative universe, I would have been happy that this was the 40th anniversary story. This oh. is all that Big Finish did. And it went out on every radio station at once across the world on the 23rd of November 2003 for the 40th. That would have been amazing. What I think this story does that none of the others in this season do is sort of like the respectable doctor who adventure you know it feels a bit trad and a bit safe and nice whereas the second one is very edgy in lots of ways the third one is dark as hell and then you know by the time we're getting to continuity porn with michael jason and arabella (laughs) we're throwing up in a toilet i mean all sense has been abandoned as it was the most traditional one is that why you wanted to sully it with an anal sex reference Yes, indeed. <laughs> I've barely begun. Oh, gosh. Shall we move on to Sympathy of the Devil? Oh, yes, please. Uh, and it's actually it's interesting because this is more of a third Doctor-y one. They didn't go for, like, one for each Doctor, obviously, which I would have might have done if I was thinking of yeah. this concept. More of a third Doctor-y one? The whole thing is built out of continuity well, yeah, but the, of the third Doctor. But these Doctor. next two are, like, third Doctor ones. There's no, like, second Doctor alternative or something. They didn't oh, go for... Oh, Obviously, saying. this one was obviously a first Doctor alternative. Well, what? They didn't really go for one each, you know, a second Doctor or anything. Apologies for putting you on the spot here, Dylan, but what would you do, then, as your Patrick Troughton what-if? Oh, I, I'd just have Patrick Troughton, but he would be blacked up on audio. <laughs> 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 How would you portray that on audio? It'd have to do a terrible accent. I- I'd have him. I'd have him land in twenty twenty four, and people just react really badly to him. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would have done something with the war games. What if he had got away at the end of the war games? And I probably would have called it Beyond the War Games. And it oh, would have been like season six B. <laughs> That's what yes. I would have done. But he doesn't sound quite like Patrick Trout, and he sounds more like his son. Yes, yeah, or or get like Fraser Hines to play him or something like that. But Fraser Hines sounds yeah. really old while still playing <laughs> the younger Jamie. Uh, uh, do you know what I would actually do as an alternative second Doctor? I would do it as that version of him that Ben and Polly don't trust in Power of the Daleks, and he never gains their trust. They leave him, and he can never quite form relationships with people because he's just this weird sort of insular pixie. That would be my alternative second doctor. That would have been a good nice. sort of darker version. Or he's constantly that washerwoman from the Highlanders, and he never got changed. 
<laughs> I think I think I, I would have done the six B like properly, but maybe done like a series of vignettes, so like mini stories across an hour of, and so like a little arc in itself, like a season. And he slowly goes towards the time war, and then Susan turns up, and it's <laughs> Susan's war. And the Doctor... Thank God you ain't right, right anyway, in this shit. Anyway, <laughs> let's get on to the next one. So, Sympathy of the, of the Devil. Mm. Sympathy for the Devil was released in June 2000, starring David Warner as the Doctor and Nicholas Courtney as the Brigadier. This features David Tennant and Mark Gatiss as Sam Kismet. Now, if you rearrange those letters, it might be a character you're aware of. So, yeah, this is What If the Doctor Had Not being UNIT's scientific advisor. Oh, over to Dylan. I love this. This is in my top ten big finish stories of all time. I, I, I think it's perfect. I have no issues with it, apart from at one point in the background you can hear Nicholas Briggs doing a pretend Chinese accent. <laughs> oh, no. Well, it doesn't start off particularly well for me because you've got that Paradise of Death opening, basically, but here we go, here we go, oh, kind of guys. It's, it's exactly like that. It put me in the front of mind of Paradise of Death. No, my, um, my heckles went up immediately when there was about 12 racist references and, yeah, and in the first them. scene. Yeah. I was like, oh no, what's happening here? But it's supposed to be. The writer who did it is like, he's. I think he either lived in Hong Kong or worked there and he writes a lot of, I feel like he writes a lot of, like books and does a lot of translations and things like that so he was chosen sort of for the cultural sensitivity of it like the racism for me is fine because it it's supposed it's supposed to show where the english are at and how fucking terrible they are basically my my point is though is that i'm my tolerance for this stuff is quite high and i i'm okay you know we did flip-flop recently where i said those evil asylum seekers that, that attacked that planet and took over everyone's rights and then basically <laughs> killed everybody that was okay it was a bit of fun but if somebody of a more sensitive disposition was listening to this, I'm talking about, you know, the young time team, then, uh, you know, Jonathan Clements might be cancelled by now. Yeah, possibly. But I think I, I think it works within the context of the story. I think it's a plot point rather than cultural insensitivity on behalf of, on the part of the company. Well, what about the story? Oh, I, I just love it. I think, I know it's absolute fan wank, but at the same time... I, I've done this, well, I've done actually all three of these I've done on Too Hot for TV at certain points. And I, I picked this one uh, for somebody who had never heard it before and wasn't huge on the sort of continuity, but got it all, you know? So I think it works as a story by itself. I just like this darker version of Classic Who. I wouldn't like Classic Who, you know, I, I want the time monster as well, but I just like this sort of alt timeline where the Doctor arrived too late, unit went to shit, the Brigadier's a laughing stop, which is tragic, uh, and then you've got the, the new run leader of unit, played brilliantly by David Tennant, who is just a complete bastard. Left bridge! <laughs> He's such an <laughs> arsehole. I like the characters here. I like, yeah, I like the stuff that they've done with the Brigadier. I wasn't so keen on the overall story. It sort of picks out the Pertwee stuff that I don't particularly like. The monk who's like the guy from Planet of the Spiders. It's sort of yeah. doing that kind of thing. It's just more of the unit peace conference type types. St- it's all those bits of the Pertwee era that I don't particularly like. So I wasn't as keen on this one. Oh, well, that, I, I, unfortunately, I'm throwing in my allegiance with Dylan because I absolutely love this one. And I, do you know what I love more? Less it was what if the Doctor was wasn't exiled to earth and more it was what if the master was exiled or stuck on earth and the scene between warner and gatis where they finally sort of open up about what's going on and and gatis is so angry as the master like you weren't here all these terrible bloody things happened and you weren't here to stop them that's that what if scenario just done to its absolute zenith i think it might be the best scene of the year it's it's a brilliant scene and i think gatis sometimes gets a bit of a bad rep and you know he writes the very traditional new series stories and the roles he's had in the new series are, are fine but i think here he really flexes his muscles and you're like oh he can you know he can do evil really well and i'm i'm a bit like i think i'd i'd be happy if he showed up for a story as the master as this version of the master on tv he's loving this though isn't he like he's yeah. playing that sort of purring menace really really well the, the fact was that he was he wanted to play one of the unbound doctors 
That's what you pitched for. And John Ainsworth, who was overseeing this range. And a quick word for John Ainsworth. <laughs> Pretty much everything he touches for Big Finish is absolute bloody gold. He's the one that stepped in when Alan Bars was busy and took over one trilogy. And that was the first Klein trilogy. Probably the mm, best right. trilogy they ever did. He's such a such a talented bloke. But anyway, John Ainsworth said, no, 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 that's too obvious. That's not make you the ma- Let's make you the master. So, And then, you know, apparently his eyes lit up. My God, you know, my dreams come true. <laughs> And against the alternative Pertwee Doctor, and you, we all know how much Gators loved that era. Yeah, oh, it was like gangbusters, I think. I like David Warner as the Doctor. I've not heard a lot of his other uh, the Bernice stuff or anything, so this was really the first time I properly listened, apart from that Once and Future, which you didn't really do very much in. You expect him to be, I don't know, to always play a baddie and, and stuff, because that's sort of what he's more known for. But I, I, yeah, I just liked his interpretation. Well, you said you absolutely loved him. I do love him. I mean, he's quite sharp around the edges, but there's still that warmth and, like, I just... He just feels like the Doctor. And he does, over the course of those Benny box sets, he does get softer, but it's there's still those rough edges. And there's the other one, Masters of War, which I haven't heard in ages, I need to hear. That's the sort of follow-up they do to this with him and Nick Courtney. And I remember loving that too. It was that they, they bugger off to Scarrow for a, an adventure with the Daleks. I love hearing Nick Courtney and him interact because they're both roughly of the same age. Maybe Warner's a bit younger. So the, the, there's, there's real good chemistry between them. And they feel like old friends, even though they've only met, you know, in this timeline, they've they've only met twice essentially for the in the the two Troughton stories, and also like, I don't think they utilised Nick Courtney enough in the early big finishes. He was around the whole time, and they, he's used very sparingly. So whenever he does show up, it feels like an absolute treat. And to hear him with Warner is just phenomenal. I can only think yeah, of four well, or five times. Up to this point, he's done Spectral Landing more. Minuet in Hell. Minuet in Hell. And that's just ticking off, just meeting those doctors. He's gonna really. do an appearance in unit. He did a, he did that one companion chronicle. Then he did that three companions thing. It, yeah, they really didn't use him a lot. There could have been a run with these he two. I think because like... Masters of War is a success as well. Nowadays there will be fifteen box sets in well, the pipeline. Yeah, you know? because uh, I think the next year they do that unit, the first unit spin off. He's in that pilot episode for it, the sort of freebie dot do mm. magazine one, and he's not in the rest. I don't think he doesn't star in it, does he? Star. Yeah. Like, why make a unit series and not star Nicholas Courtney? I was just. Well, they've got their new hot unit regulars, and now they've got mm. Gemma Redgrave. So I don't think I don't think they've got Gemma Redgrave for much longer, to be honest. I think she's she's going on the telly. There is a cast member that stood out as well, which I didn't realize. I recognised her voice, and I was like, "Where have I heard her before?" Uh, and it's Liz Sutherland who plays Ling. And she is in my favourite big finish, Winter for the Adept. She's the other one that oh, the other girl she's in that's the with India, mate, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, of course. Who I've got her first ever autograph, and she's written that down in the thing. So um, I reckon, <laughs> yeah, first I, I love, and only. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love Liz Sutherland. Yeah, it's Can nice I, to hear her. Just another word for David Warner. I just his voice is like honey. It is so. <laughs> I'm not Honey. quoting Battlefield. Um, it's so rich. Like I could just li- like, when yeah. he goes on to do the. Did you listen to the Sapphire and Steel ones with him in it? Yes, I did. Fucking brilliant. Brilliant, weren't they? And him and Susanna Harker had great chemistry as well. But I remember him being like a real arsehole in this. What I took away from this listen was actually he had a lot of moments where he was quite wistful, and melancholic, yeah. and there's a moment where he's talking about. Um, some of his travels that he's been on, things like that, and and describing them in this really yeah. poetic way. I thought, my God, there's a companion chronicle in him somewhere. Mm. No, just wonderful. Mm. Yeah, of of the six, do you think he's the best? Unbound. He's he's my favourite. But what I would say is the final three I've not heard for probably a decade. So when we come to do those, I'm very excited to re-listen. There's to a them. reason so. for that, you know. <laughs> Jonathan Clements, the writer of this wonderful tale, says, John Ainsworth wanted something like the end of the world, with everything going horribly wrong and everybody dying. I said to him, you realise you're asking for Evangelion? What's that? Evangelical? No, Evangelion, a famous Japanese cartoon. He thought about it for a moment and said, yes, please, with dinosaurs. He also told me Nicholas Courtney would be available, so I I was welcome to have an alternative brigadier to go with the alternative doctor. 
My first idea was to do something that capitalised on the world overrun with Silurians and dinosaurs with no plastics available, a kind of post-Holocaust situation. I had an opening sequence inspired by aliens with a unit squad decimated by shrieking raptors. That does sound pretty good. Uh, and a group of medics dragging a mortally wounded brigadier to safety while an officer screams, Somebody get me a doctor! And then you hear the TARDIS materialises and the theme tune kicks in. But then John told me that they had Mark Gatiss. Uh, I hope you don't mind, he said. But could you work the master in as well? <laughs> it's a bit like season 18, isn't it? With Chris Rage yeah. Bidmead. Um, did they put the anagram of his name in the cover? Did anyone know this? I remember being shocked at the time. I could remember listening to this for the first time and thinking it was brilliant. And when the reveal is that the, he's the master, it came as a shock. There wasn't like... Nobody was... I mean, I doubt I was online, or if I was online, it was very early, but nobody was talking about, oh, well, Mark Gates is the master, so it worked. What did you think about all of this sort of pulling together all the Pertwee stories, but giving them a spin because the Doctor wasn't there? I think it's... I mean, you know, it's something Ross T. Davis does a bit in Turn Left, but it, it, of course it makes perfect sense because, of course, every time, if the Doctor wasn't there, everything would go tits up. And I love that line of every time you had a peace conference, somebody died as uh, David Tennant's character shrieked at the Brigadier and, you know, him blowing up half of the, the, the home counties and stuff. And it's like, yeah, because... He's a soldier with his soldier brain and he's just responding the best he can and he needs the Doctor there who's A, that bit more sort of... He's that science, he's the intelligence, but also a bit more morally sensitive. Can we have a quick moment for Brimmick and Wood, please? Who I think is the modern-day unit character who just... I think they wanted to say fucking shit, but they settle for sort of bloody... He says the word bloody quite a lot. But it's quite refreshing, isn't it? Just to have a complete arse wipe that swears a lot. Yeah, it, it, it's such a shame David Tennant's been in Doctor Who a couple of times as other characters, otherwise it'd be great to bring into the new series. Yeah, he's too big for this now, isn't he? <laughs> Does he do the Unit series? The first one? Uh, he's in one of them. He's in one, yeah, isn't he's he? in yeah. one of them. But he's only he's available for audios now when there's a pandemic. Yeah, so well, Nick Briggs is desperately trying to engineer another one in his, his loft. <laughs> <laughs> I would have put it past him. <laughs> Anything else on? Um, no. Oh, another word for the sound design on this one, though, and yeah. the music as well, because it really it starts off slow, and it ramps up in the last half an hour. Do, do you know what we haven't talked about on either of them? They both get new themes as well, don't they? Is it all the same theme for all three of no, them? No, each one has a different theme, and they're all very Doctor Who fans having a go at making a Doctor Who theme. They're fine. But they're not, you know, like that's the New Adventures one that they use for McCoy or the uh, War Doctor ones, which are like big and you're like, oh, someone's had a real good go at that. This is just like, I was in my bedroom and I made a new Doctor Who theme last night. I could have sworn they were all exactly the same. I didn't hear any <laughs> difference at all. They all sound like the sort of variations on a theme soundtrack, don't they? Yeah. You know, yeah, the, Kef's exactly. done it on his, what's that yeah. machine called he uses? A synthesizer. I'll be utilising all of them as the theme tune for Too Hot for TV at some point, I'm sure, as I slowly run out of themes. They, just, oh, they should have done the Diddly Dum for these ones. Diddly Dum? The Diddly Dum. <laughs> you know, the alternative third Doctor one. Oh! <laughs> Isn't that what it's called? Or a bunch of <laughs> yeah, that one. The, the Delaware theme. So called because the Delaware was the synthesizer they created it on. Oh. It's the one mistake Barry Letts did. And he sorted it out before it got out there, so great. <laughs> <laughs> the one mistake Barry Letts did, otherwise he is perfect in every way. <laughs> Full Fathom 5 was released in July 2003, and this stars David Collings as the Doctor. Uh, this also features Ed Bishop and Siri O'Neill. Wow, this is interesting, because on the, on the blurbs for all these, we've had what if the Doctor, what if. This one just says what if. Does that mean it's, it's open not to interpretation? Obvious. <laughs> Uh, it's not obvious what the they, what if well, they is. They say it in the book. Oh, do they? Yeah, what if the yeah. Doctor goes too far? I thought it was what if the Doctor believed the ends justified the means. So it's another alternative third Doctor in my head. So David Collings as well. I mean, I, w I could imagine David Warner being this Doctor. Yeah, I'll totally. Yeah. Playing this. And David Collins isn't the most obvious because you see him as that sort of nice guy from Robots of Death. Yeah. Have we just established that David Warner should play all of these on Bad yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We just want more yeah. David Warner. Unfortunately, we're going to get some. Yeah. It, I don't think he was that 
bad. It's not like a bad doctor. He just goes a little bit too far. This is what the war doctor should have been like. Or yes. Should be like. Oh yes. I don't think the war doctor has done anything as bad as what the doctor does in this. No, the war doctor just walks into a room and go, and someone goes, Doctor, and he goes, don't call me that. And everybody goes, okay, Doc, d- uh, mate. That, Somehow it. they get eight boxers out of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. so that, that's what I was thinking about all this time. And you get, you know, you're getting Worries of the Deep, Sea Devils vibes. Not hearing this before, I had no idea where this was going. So that the ending was a bit of a shock yeah. to me. Um I, re- that, I think that's probably why I really enjoyed this one. And I had no idea. And it took me a while as well in the story. I didn't realise it was going back and forth. It's a sort of flashback. It took me a long time to actually work that out. So I was quite yeah. confused. Is it because I didn't use the harp? <laughs> well, I don't know. I just didn't really... I, just, I thought, is this happening at the same time? What's going... You know, what's happening? But once I'd got that clear in my head, I really enjoyed this. I love this one as well. I mean, I think there's... My my only issue with it really is the American accents, and I think Ed Bishop is actually American, but it's still there's something about the American accents in this that that are a little bit grating. But I remember hearing this for the first time and being really uncomfortable with the ending, and, and maybe I was fourteen, something like that. When was it? No, twenty twenty three. I was not fourteen. Two thousand three. Uh, I was twenty, so not fourteen. The opposite of fourteen. It's not that I didn't like it but I just never thought of the Doctor as a villain. I think it's why, to this day, I still don't really like Invasion of Time either, because I don't like the Doctor being a complete cunt. Um, I think there needs to be a sort of softer side, but I, I just I think it's brilliant. I suppose you can buy it here, because it's an alternative universe Doctor. Yeah, but yeah, also, saying that, all the, even the, the stuff that he does in this, I can see Pertwee doing all of this. Oh, yeah. What? And he sounds have a, a gun and shoot I himself see him doing, and I, the think, I think he does. I think... Per, like the third doctor's got a death count on him I, he, yeah. like they all do what do you yeah, <laughs> i know but I, it wasn't so terrible like i could see all this happening and like if this was like a pertwee 90s spin-off film i could see everything happen i could see pertwee choking on that key <laughs> you know <laughs> you doing all of that stuff i could see all of that happening like it's not so out there it's not i do totally... love the idea of the doctor being shot over and over again and each yeah. time it's a different character actor popping yeah. up yeah. you know me too. now big finish to do a box out of that Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> patricia routledge all of them can i be the outlier then please because uh please i do. loved this when i was a kid and i wrote i've got a review on doco reviews where i absolutely went to town with the praise and i did like this like it's it's good doctor who i can't believe i'm gonna say this it's a little too melodramatic even for me <laughs> and everything is pitched at 11 in this story like there's yeah. there's no point where it comes down and that poor woman who goes on to play a regular in the what's her name ruth Ruth. Yeah. She is hysterical throughout the entire... She must have been exhausted at the end of this shoot. Oh, she, she, she's been through a lot. <laughs> yeah, so have I by the end of this. <laughs> and you know that bit in... It reminded me a bit of... Go with me here. The Power of Kroll. You remember that bit in episode four where all the men are shouting at each other on the oil rig and there's guns coming out and they're all making accusations... But this whole story is basically that moment for an hour. Your ghastly experiments, what were you doing? My God, no, it's a perversion of mankind. You're all of this. But saying that, it is it is like goofy fun, isn't it? It's yeah. it's down in a in a sea base and it's monstrous experiments and it's an evil doctor and oh, you know what? It's it's all that stuff that we sort of love. No, but he's not evil, is he? He's just ruthless. Yeah, no, he's he's trying to stop a bad situation. He's not creating a bad situation. He's trying to sort it out, but he doesn't care how he sorts it out. I'm reminded a little bit of the end of Claws of Axos, where he actually... Well, I mean, obviously he pretends to be siding with the Master, but he does try and bugger off at the end. And I think that it's like... Imagine if you'd been stuck there that long... Uh, that he's just got more and more desperate and desperate and desperate. So I, I can I can buy it. I'm reminded of that bit in, and I can say it to you two, because all three of us have recently read this book, that bit in The Eight Doctors where he grabs the tissue compression annihilator <laughs> and threatens The Eight Doctor and says, I'm taking your TARDIS, I'm sick to death of being on the Earth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He that. did have a bit of bite to him, Poe, didn't he? Not mm. quite this much, I don't think. But, but... Uh, he, um, David Collins does sound a lot like Poe in this, I thought. There's a few yeah. lines where he's proper like, Ruth, 
<laughs> he proper does that. Is he channeling his he inner Pert He does a few lines. Yeah. But the best thing about this is, from the beginning, we know there's some deep, dark secret on the seabed, don't we? They, they make yeah. that very clear, very early, and we're going down there to find out what it is. So you've got suspense from the first scene, and it doesn't disappoint when it comes. It's a D-E-E-P secret. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wasn't that annoying? Uh, did I do too many E's then? No, you did too. <laughs> that American man, he never said deep, did he? Every time he went, well, D-E-E-P. <laughs> and I don't know if it was the accents, but I think it was the the general in my head looked like Sidney Newman. So maybe that's what made it interesting for me. I could just see him there that's in his nuts. suit. Like, this is nuts, doctor. Pop, pop, pop. <laughs> so maybe that's why I enjoyed it as well. Well, anything else, guys, about 4, 5 and 5? No, we've kind of whizzed through this quite quickly, but they they're all they all pack a lot in. But they're also very slight, you know, at an hour. There isn't... It, it, you, you get to where you're going pretty quickly, apart from with the first one. Um, but, yeah, Full Fathom 5, I think it's the most uncomfortable a big finish has made me at this point, I think. I think it's... Uh, this. I, I'm, I'm not used to... I know it's the twist and it's supposed to do that, but every time I hear it, I'm just like, oh, I really don't like the Doctor doing that, which is the idea. But it's just so ingrained in me that the Doctor wouldn't behave like that. Uh, it's a perfect way to celebrate the 40th anniversary. <laughs> Turn the Doctor into a complete <laughs> yes. bastard. I think the only time where I've been more uncomfortable than this, listening to something on our journey so far, is the Holy Terror. Moments in the Holy uh, Terror that I just thought were so disgusting, <laughs> and yeah. but but played for comedy. Like that little midget that had his leg cut off to, in order to fit inside the Dalek. You know, mm-hmm. things like that. that that's Jubilee. Yeah. That's what I meant. What did I say? Holy terror. Holy terror. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, the, the Holy Terror actually had a few moments as well. And actually, he did suicide. But that's all Rob Shearman, isn't it? And guess what, folks? He's coming up later in the season and he's touching up a kid in the cupboard. So, you know. <laughs> I mean, you can see why the BBC were uncomfortable with Big Finish doing any more unbound stuff or wanting, or other. I mean, it might not have been that reason, but having other unbound doctors and do it. But I think it's great that they did this experiment. Yeah, and I, I think it works for the time period. I would be worried now if they got a license to do six more that it'd be a bit lacklustre. And it's, it's like in the fortieth anniversary year when there is just no Doctor Who until someone at the end goes, "Hi, I'm Russell T Davis. I'm making a new series." But Doctor Who feels so absent, and it feels like it's not coming back. It's sort of the only time you can do it, and also everybody gives it a hundred and ten percent, even if it doesn't always work. But well, they are so... they're unique, aren't they? They're individual yeah. story. If they were doing it now, it would literally be they'd create an Unbound Doctor, and it'd be the Unbound Doctor meets the Paternoster Gang, the Tar and Wood Beast, and River Song. Well, you know, that was what the story would be. If they did, they have done it recently. I'm we've only heard the first one of the sixth doctor unbound yeah but it's just fucking colin baker awful i i only lasted half an hour he really? loved it he i mean loved the first it. we've only heard the first one <laughs> no, but i think it's because it had bits of the chase God, and turgid it was uh, yeah it wasn't anything like the quality of these ones no well the, you, i think the, the, the key element is the simplicity of these mm. It's got an idea, it tells a very sort of simple story each time and just mm. runs with the, the concept that they're going for each time. Can I ask you a question then? Yeah. Um, do you think that the only way they could do an extended run of Unbound stories going forward is to do what they did and that is take an established range, Bernie Summerfield, and bolt the Doctor into that? I think so, yeah. That that feels like... I, I'm sure I'm, their licence basically says they can't have a new Doctor, I don't think. And I think they get away with it with David Warner because it's Benny, because it's an old universe, and probably because it's David Warner. And I also think that now Rossity Davis is back in charge, he keeps a lot... Or his team keep a lot stronger of an eye on what Big Finish are doing, whereas during the Chibnall and Moffat era, they were pretty much able to get away with anything they wanted. And now less so. Yeah, exactly. I th- I think if we suddenly had a box set starring Hayley Atwell as the Doctor, it'd be- I mean, look how long we've had to wait for the Ruth Doctor one, which presumably was held, well, we know was held up by the BBC, so for whatever reason. They just needed the word, that's what Nick Briggs said in that episode. Yeah, and it's probably because they're just launching the first sort of full-time Doctor of Colour, and they don't want anything stepping on their toes. 
And since this episode has become a massive you know, jerk off to David Warner. It's probably worth saying that in the book here, in the special features, you know, the the, doc, the audio interviews they put on the releases and all of that, yeah. David Warner has done movies. He's a he's a big name yeah. for Big Finish, and he was utterly humble about doing them. And he says in every interview, "I love doing these audios. I don't get that. I'm just getting coffee money. I get to spread my wings on audio." I just think that's wonderful. It's wonderful that they, yeah. they, they managed to capture the interest of this astonishing thespian yeah. and got all this work out of him. It felt like for a while he was the first sort of star that really wanted to associate with Big Finish and there's there's been lots of them. And there's also been lots that we've had they've got before they were stars. But they, he like I think he was a real stamp of approval for a lot of a lot of getting other names by going, well, we've got David Warner. Do you want to do something with David Warner? And people going, even Christopher Eccleston was very excited to work with David Warner and he's never excited about anything apart from Nick Briggs scripts, apparently. <laughs> and getting Ross of T. Davis sacked. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, they probably, when they're doing the rounds of phone calls for the Unbounds, they probably phoned up Derek Jacoby and they went, well, we've got David Warner. Oh, all right, I'll do it, you know. Well, a successful three, I think. Yeah. Oh, actually, I want to ask you, how would you rank them? Uh, Sympathy for the Devil, Full Fathom 5, and then um, Old Mortality. I would go Old Mortality, uh, Full Fathom 5, and Sympathy <laughs> for the Devil. <laughs> and just to be an annoying prick, I'd go Old Mortality, Sympathy for the Devil... <laughs> Did we have yeah, any? We, was anyone in agreement there? So. No. Oh dear. I don't think so. Well, look, I'm well, going to do my doco ho on the second episode and do the whole lot. Oh, oh, oh right. I'm going to bore you to death. Yeah. Well, well, we've got no... another recording tonight as well, so I thought I wouldn't be too long. There's no chronology moment because these are all unofficial doctors. Yeah. But actually, apart from David Warner, because he's part of the Benice universe. This one yeah. could go just be set just before the the Benice set. Oh, so, so you recognise? So him I would as I would recognise him because of all the Benice stuff, but not the others. That's my rules. Has anyone heard that first Benice one? Does she just skip into another universe? Essentially, yeah. I can't remember, but I've heard them all. So um, the Cyberman <laughs> you know, one was great, wasn't it? The Cyberman one is the best one. Well, that's one of my favourite big finishes of the last few years. Which was it's probably about ten years old now, and I just don't remember fantastic that only leaves us to do one thing and i'm reliably informed that dylan reese is extremely adept at oral audacity (laughs) do you know how we do this with a guest i I ask the questions that's right Excellent. I mean, one of them we've already answered. So. Well, no, because there's well, two we'll characters just... I've forgotten. Your I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. What new adventure did Badger appear in? <gasps> oh. oh. Um, um, the Pit. <laughs> Is it Lungbarrow? It was Lungbarrow. Well done. Well done. The other character, Quincy's. Is he in Lungbarrow as well, Quincy's? Oh, maybe he is, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. he might be. I really want to read Lungbarrow now. Which incarnation of the Doctor was David Warner avail- availability checked for in real life? No! Oh, I want to say Tom Bacon's. Imagine him in Terror of the Zygons. I want to say third. Imagine him in Inferno. It was the fourth Doctor. He was availability checked. He was busy. Uh, and it was to to play the fourth Doctor, but he was. It's one of those things where people go, "Oh, he was up for the part." It's, they were literally like, "Would David be interested?" And he was like, he, "He's in the states for six months or something." So I bet it. he's kicking right. himself now. And I know he had a great career. He is in everything, isn't he? He, he is it. booked and busy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well then, here's a question to you two: What would have been David Warner's best performance as the fourth Doctor? Name your story. I quite like to see him do that what's it for speech in the pirate planet but he wouldn't have stuck around that long he would have been like two three seasons and done wouldn't he um maybe because it's fresh in my mind maybe in invasion of time he would have been quite yeah quite good as the sort of baddie there and he probably would have made underworld pretty watchable well i was going to say underworld just for the bit i think the moment where he would have decided to quit was that bit where he was gracefully floating down that lift shaft with that 
music. That's when he quit. Imagine Underworld being the fourth Doctor's regeneration story. I'm not doing this shit. James Cameron's on the phone. Hello, Titanic. Um, And your final question. Who plays the unnamed Doctor at the end of Full Fathom 5? Oh, that's um, Ed Bishop. No, no, no. Is it not? When the Doctor regenerates. Oh, can you, can you, um, um, is it somebody we know? It's somebody who's a regular in Big Finish. Oh, Helen Goldwyn. (laughs) No. I thought it was Ed Bishop as doing a different... Not Nicholas Briggs. No. Oh, Alistair Locke. Who is it? No, don't look in the sleeve, yes. (laughs) Um, I don't don't think it's in the sleeve. I don't know. He's a stalwart... Is it Jeremy James? No. No, he's a regular at the time. It is... Sophie Aldred. (laughs) Um, No, I don't know. It's Ian Brooker. Ian Brooker, yes. Is he from the Dalek Empire? Is that Albie Brook? I think so, yeah. And also, he's officially the shortest... The, sh- the shortest ever doctor. <laughs> At one word. <laughs> yeah. He's in, Hello. <laughs> Ian Brooker is in, in Ord Mortality. As? As Surus. Su- oh, I don't remember that character. Sorry, Ian Brooker, you weren't too memorable. I think that was one all. Yeah, one all. Okay, fair. Well fair. Done. I think we're going to turn the tables in episode two when we do the second half and we'll ask you the questions. You can grill me whenever you want. Oh, what? What an offer. Um, <laughs> I have to let you know, I'm a hard taskmaster, all right? <laughs> so I've heard. <laughs> Where do we go from here? <laughs> um, maybe I should say the next three that we're going to be doing next episode. Oh, yeah. Uh, if I can remember what they're called. They are called He Jests at Scars, Deadline, and Exile. With the definitive female doctor. <laughs> Which I'm not looking forward to listening to. Spoiler two of the three of the next episode are considered to be the worst two Big Finish <laughs> stories ever. I'm secretly hoping I love them all. I'm hoping we all listen to Exile and come away thinking it is just glorious. I feel like these three are the more safer options and then the next three are the completely out there yeah. stories. I'm currently binge watching Men Behaving Badly and Two Pints of Lager and a Packet of Crisps just so I'm in the right headspace for that Eric <laughs> Bella Weir story. I-, I literally watched episodes of that those for the first time in decades the other night. Did you laugh? I didn't find myself laughing too often. Um, no. Um, no I didn't to be honest. It's, it's qu- quite weird. It's It's weird how those sitcoms basically a lot of their jokes are either sexual harassment or homophobia. Or, like, shit. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, um, join us next time for the next three Unbounds. That's right. Dylan, will you join us in the sign-off? Uh, yes, I will. Okay. And don't forget, everybody, in the meantime... To... To... Finish... Finish.